way, this coming Sunday, as you know, or this coming weekend, we change our service time. So Saturday night at 5.30, we're going to have free pizza. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was so funny. The first two services, they were so quiet when I said that. It's like, very healthy eaters. But, but we don't care. We don't care. We don't care. We're going to eat pizza. So I'm sure I'm going to have a slice. But anyway, I just wanted to let you know that. And the other thing I wanted to mention real quick, and I know we've got so many announcements. Ugh. But one more thing. The, the second Sunday of September, September 13th, we're bringing back the series, No Perfect People Allowed. Yeah. Different messages, same theme, that God uses flawed, broken people. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a few moments. And so what we're doing it different. This coming, a little bit different. Uh, I'm preaching from the Word, but we're also going to use movie clips from different movies that will highlight truths from God's Word about how He can redeem any person's life, any situation, right? So the very first one that we're going to do is going to be, uh, we're going to get a lot out of it as adults, but we're also going to involve our elementary kids. We're going to be looking at some clips from Big Hero 6. Yeah, and so the elementary kids will be in here somewhere. Uh, Mar you know, in a reserved place. We have some, some of them here on the platform. They're going to help me with the message. It's going to be phenomenal. Um, yeah, it's going to be really good. And so each weekend we'll have different, um, uh, different movie clips. I'm going to be preaching the word, but these clips will just kind of reinforce those points. But it's going to be an interesting way. Actually, it's going to be the perfect, perfect, perfect series to invite your friends. It's going to be so good, you're going to even want to invite your enemies. Your in-laws and your outlaws. I mean, everybody. It's going to be awesome, all right? Okay, let's get right into the scriptures. This is the final message of our series um, entitled The Heart of the Matter. And we've been talking about how God uh, binds up the brokenhearted and heals us of our wounds. So we know life is an awesome thing. Uh, life is full of adventure, full of victories, full of love, full of connection. But the other side of life, we also know from experience that it entails hurts, setbacks, pains, brokenheartedness, disappointments, and God is keenly aware of those area, those things in our lives. He's keenly aware of the things that we pick up, and some of it's very traumatic. Some of the wounds, the pains, the hurts we experience, massively traumatic, tragic for many people, and affect us in, in such a huge way. For others, it may not be as noticeable, but it's things that still, unfortunately, shape us and define us. God, knowing this, steps in and promises to bring healing where only He can. All right? Remember we talked about the, the nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty, sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. I know you love this, right? What I love about God is that He can put all the pieces back together again. He can heal us when in the natural there's no there's no promise, no way, no how is it going to happen. But Jesus said in Luke 4 that he binds up the brokenhearted, that he sets the captive free. Isn't that good news, everybody? And so we've been talking about that. If you've missed it, you can get the messages on the website. What I'd like to do in the time we have left is take a look at some principles that we see here in a passage of Scripture that help us, you and I, to be able to really connect with and experience God's healing and wholeness in our lives. So not just physical healing, which God promises and provides for us, but even much deeper than that, the healing of the soul, the healing of the heart, the healing of the wounds of life, no matter how deep they are, no matter how deep the cuts of life go. God's promise is to heal us from the inside out. And so in this passage of Scripture that I'm going to read, we see three principles that I think are very, very important that help you and I to really tap into the healing that we need from God. And I'll be honest with you. Listen, folks, it doesn't matter. I've not necessarily, I mean, Bonnie and, I, Bonnie and I have had some pretty tragic things happen in our lives, but even if your life has been fairly simple, fairly normal, we still pick up stuff. There are still things that happen. And we don't realize how much those things can affect us and that's why it's so important for us to realize and experience God's healing, right? So let's look at this passage here in John chapter 5. If you don't have it, uh, just follow along with me. John, the fifth chapter. And we'll see this scenario of 
this, uh, an event, a situation that takes place between Jesus and a crippled man. Sometime later, it says, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades or porches. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Well, there was one who had been an invalid, paralyzed for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. So one transla another translation says that the, the, uh, the, um, the, the uh, legend was is that the uh, angels would come down, the story is, and they would stir up the waters. And while the waters were stirred, if you got in at that point, you would be healed. So he's saying, I don't have anyone to set me in the water when the waters are stirred. And so, uh, th so then Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, picked up his mat and walked. The day on which he took this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath, and the law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed, he didn't have any idea who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found the man in the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. So what we see here in this passage of Scripture, very, very important. Uh, I think uh, there's several things, several truths that we can pull out of that, uh, out of that passage but there's three that I want us to really focus on this morning. And the first one is this. Healing, healing from God is a partnership between us and God. Healing is a partnership between us and God. So in other words, you don't see in the scriptures Jesus healing someone without that person asking for or seeking healing from him. You don't see that. People are responding to what they've seen or what they've heard. They're initiating. They're bringing their need. They're placing their faith, their trust in Christ. So we see healing is a partnership. And same thing in this, in this uh, paragraph, this, this situation here, we see that healing is a partnership. As a matter of fact, Jesus looked at this man and he asked him a question that really seems insensitive, uncompassionate. He looks at a man whose legs are twisted up for 38 years, paralyzed. He's, and he's, at, he's, he's by the pool of Bethesda. He's at the place where the sick and the crippled people are, waiting for the waters to be stirred so they can get healed. So they're at a place seeking healing, right? But Jesus looks at the man and he says, do you want to get well? Now, that seems a little insensitive when you first read that, does it not? I mean, let me put it in context. Let's say you're at the hospital, and you, you've got the bad flu, or you're sick or something. I hear about it. I come visit you. They got you all hooked up with IVs. You're trying to get better. I come by, and I say, hey, John, I, I, I heard you're in the hospital here. I know you're not feeling well. I'm going to pray for you, but I got a question to ask you first. Do you really want to be well? You would think, Pastor Mike, that's kind of insensitive. Like, duh, I'm hooked up. Hello, McFly. Did I, did I just date myself? Anybody know where that movie's from? All right, okay, you guys didn't respond. All right, so, but it seems very insensitive. But here's what Jesus knew. The question had a tremendous amount of purpose behind it. Jesus realized human nature is the longer a man or a woman can find themselves broken, or hurt, or wounded, or crippled, the longer that that goes on, the more tendency they have to identify themselves with their brokenness. Jesus wanted to make sure that this crippled man hadn't been crippled for so long that he found himself defined by his infirmity, by being paralyzed. Jesus wanted to make sure that this guy really did want to be made well. Because in a few moments later on, we read it, Jesus said, take up your mat and walk. In other words, Jesus was saying this, I know that you've been crippled for a long time, and I'm going to give you your legs back again. 
I need to know how bad you want this. Do you really want to be made well? Because when I give you your legs back again, you're probably going to have to go get a job. You're going to have to re-engage in life. You're going to have to take personal responsibility for your life again. Because for 38 years, you haven't had to take personal responsibility. For 38 years, you've had an excuse. You didn't have to show up and do everything everybody else was doing because you were on a mat, because you're crippled up. But I'm about to change that. And I want to change that, but I just need to know how badly you want to change because I need to make sure you're not so identified with your crippledness, you're not able to handle the freedom that comes from being well right does that make sense everybody and so he is he was and the same is true for us it is a partnership it's this partnership where God is saying listen I I want to I want to cure you I want to heal you I want to bind you up I want to take care of you I want to make you whole again but here's what that means you're going to have to live whole if I make you whole and here's the other part of this partnership is as I said uh, uh, early on, I said that that you don't see in the scriptures where Jesus just sovereignly healing somebody. You see him responding to th- their desire to be made well. So let me say it this way. I've said this before. It was quite a while ago, but I want to repeat it and say it again in the context of, of today's message. And here's the statement. God doesn't respond to need. In other words, our need doesn't automatically elicit a response from God to meet that need. God doesn't respond to need. If God did respond to need, we'd never have any needs. Because as soon as a need came up, God would see it. It would cause him to react and respond to it. He'd go. He'd meet that need. We wouldn't have a need. See, I know God doesn't respond to need because I've had things that needed to be fixed in my life. And I've carried those things for years and God hadn't touched them changed it, healed it, or fixed it. I know God doesn't respond to need. God responds to faith. He doesn't respond to need. God responds to people who come to him and say, I'm broken, I'm wounded, I'm hurting, I've got pain, I need to be whole, I need to be healed up from this, I need your touch in my life. I'm asking you, God, to do in my life what only you can do and what no one else can do. All the king's horses and all the king's men can't put me back together again, but you can. I'm putting my trust in God responds to faith, right? That's why oftentimes you see throughout the scriptures Jesus saying this, your faith has made you well. Or, according to your faith, may it be true to you. Does this make sense, everybody? Because he sees faith, he recognizes faith. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We must believe that he exists and that he rewards us, that he answers us, that he responds to our faith that we put in him, our trust that we put in him. That's what God responds to. You see what I'm saying? Healing, being whole of our brokenness starts with realizing that Jesus is the only one that can put us back together again. And realizing that God's not going to just respond to the brokenness. He's going to respond to our faith. And then we experience his healing, right? That's number one. Number two, healing is a lifestyle. So I'll just put it very simply. If when God heals us and puts us back together again, then God expects us to live healed, to live whole. So he's not. So in other words, healing is not just an event. It's a lifestyle. It's not something that God just does in a moment in time or in a short period of time uh, that we can actually measure or define. In God's heart and mind, healing is for a lifetime. In other words, whatever God does to put us back and patch us up and restore us and redeem us and, and heal us, He expects us to walk that out for the rest of our lives. He doesn't, when He touches our lives and heals us from a broken heart, he, expe- he, he, he expects us to live out the rest of our lives as whole, healed people whose hearts are no longer broken. Just like with this man. Take up your mat and walk. Walk out. Live it out now. I've made you well. Matter of fact, I read it, it goes further down. Jesus finds him and says, now you're well, so stop your sinning unless something worse happens to you. Now, let me explain this. In the religious mindset, the religious leaders, they believed that any time you were sick, any time anything bad happened to you, it was because of sin in your life. I'm telling you that's not true. 
There was a man born blind. The disciples asked Jesus, hey, he was born blind. What caused it? Well, was it his sin or the sin of his parents? Jesus said neither. So there are times that things happen in our lives. It has nothing to do with sin. It's just we live in a fallen world. The devil's active. He's trying to mess us up, right? But there are times, though, according to the scriptures here, where our sin can open a door and allow the enemy to come in and start messing our lives up. Is that not true, everybody? Absolutely. And so this happened to be the case with this guy. Jesus knew this, being God in the flesh. So he walked up to him and he said, healing is not just an event, son. You and I just had a moment, and I gave you your legs back again. But it's not just an event. It's a lifestyle. So I'm telling you, stop your sinning unless something worse happens to you. Live your life out now as a man who is whole and thankful to God. Right? So let me, let me illustrate it this way. Uh, sometimes people need healing in their finances. Now, we can experience financial crisis, and it's not our fault at all. Not, not, it's not our fault. But sometimes we can experience financial crisis, and we can live on the bottom end financially and constantly have more month than we have money. Sometimes that's not our fault, but a lot of times that's our own doing. Now, I know that, that wasn't a big amen moment. I didn't expect it to be. But, 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 you know, where we spend more than we earn. And I've done that before. Anybody else have done, has anybody else done that before? You know, and some folks will do that, and it's a lifestyle. So for years they do it, right? And then here's what I've seen happen, where they'll do that. They'll get themselves in a jam. They'll cry out to God in faith. God will come and deliver them and heal their finances, give them a miracle, but healing's not an event, it's a lifestyle. So just like Jesus said to this crippled man, now you're well, I fixed it for you. Now stop your sinning or something worse may happen. In this situation with the finances, it could be like this. God says, hey, listen, I bailed you out. I gave you a financial miracle, so stop your spending or something worse may happen to you. You know, in other words, change your lifestyle. Live out as a wise, whole person. Does this make sense, everybody? Healing is not an event. It's a lifestyle. Our physical bodies. We can, we can experience physical uh, illness. It has nothing to do. It's no problem, nothing that we did wrong. There's other times that we can experience physical maladies in our body, and it really is what we've done. We've not eaten right, or we've eaten too much. We've eaten the wrong things. We haven't exercised. We haven't taken care of this, this temple that God's given us. Right, everybody? And, and, and so sometimes we bring it on ourselves, don't we? Okay. And, and so, but you know what will happen oftentimes? We'll be in a bad, we'll be in, bad in, in, in a bad way physically, and we'll say, God, heal me. And God loves us. He comes in there and he touches our body and heals us. And then he says, now change your lifestyle because it's not just an event. So start eating better. Take care of yourself. Exercise a little bit. Walk around the block. Do something active. Eat the right foods. Live longer and do more great things for the kingdom. Right? Okay? Isn't that good? Here's the third and final one. The third and final one is that healing is, is as much about God meeting the need. It's really about God, re, God redeeming the purpose for our lives. So healing is about redeeming God's purpose for our lives. So as much as God loves to come in and meet the need, even beyond that, God sees the purpose that each one of us have. And his desire is for us to live out that purpose because he knows a broken heart steals it. He knows the wounds of life steal it. He knows the hurts of our history steal it. He knows the pain of the past can steal our purpose, right? So God comes in and he puts us back together again and he makes us whole so we can live out the purpose that he has for our lives. Powerful thing. You know, again, this paralyzed guy, and I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it's, happens oftentimes. It's just kind of a little sidebar. When God comes in and changes our lives, a lot of times the people around us it makes them uncomfortable because they're used to seeing us broken. They're used to seeing us wounded. They're used to seeing us the way we were. It's like this lame man. It, it's so, it, it's so sadly humorous to me. But here's a guy, 38 years, 
at the pool of Bethesda. Now, you know the religious leaders he ran into after his healing. They knew this cat. They knew this guy. They were familiar with him. Now they're seeing, did anybody else see how bizarre this is? They're seeing a guy who for 38 years has had twisted limbs. Now he's walking, carrying his mat. And the only thing they can say to him is, what are you doing carrying your mat on the Sabbath? You're breaking the law. You're breaking the rules. You would think they would say, aren't you, John? Aren't you the guy whose legs twisted up 38? Yeah, that's me. What in the world happened? This is phenomenal, John. You're what? That's not what their response was. Their response was, this is the Sabbath. Our rules say you can't carry your mat on that. You know what they were telling him? Get back on your mat. You know what will happen when you and I begin to live whole? I'm just warning you, there's a lot of folks that aren't going to be used to you living whole and well and healed, and they're going to try to tell you to get back on your mat. But you need to tell them, no, 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 the guy that healed me and made me whole and made me right told me I could carry my mat not only on Sunday but every day of the week. Right? Does that make sense? So just be ready. But healing is to restore God's purpose. God had a purpose for that man, and he wasn't going to fulfill it all twisted up. He was only going to fulfill it as a man walking. You're only going to fulfill it as a man or a woman walking whole. God loves to heal us, to make us right, to restore his purpose back in our lives. Because you do have a purpose. Now, here's why this is so, so important, this final point. It's because the devil, as we said last weekend, is such an opportunist. So he takes advantage of the wounds and the hurts and the pain of our lives. And he begins to convince us that we don't have a real purpose, that all of the stuff that's happened to us has stolen our purpose, and it can never be recovered. It sounds something like this. I'm just a struggling alcoholic. God can never use me. I've been divorced so I'm sure God can't use me. I've had an abortion. I've been through bankruptcy. I've been addicted to drugs. I've got too many tattoos. That's the one Bonnie uh, struggled. Bonnie, Bonnie struggled with so much. She didn't have too many tattoos. That was a joke. <laughs> Can you imagine Bonnie with tattoos? All right. So I've got. <laughs> that would be me. That would not be Bonnie. I've got too many. <laughs> I'm just a sinner. I could never <laughs> reach anyone for Jesus. I'm too broken to be good for God. I'm defective. I'm damaged goods. That's the lie of the enemy. That's the thing that the enemy says to you and I. God wants to make us whole. They're one of the reasons why he promises to bind up the broken hearts and heal us from the wounds of, our li of life is because he loves restoring his purpose back to our lives. And as a matter of fact, it's the very people that I just described. Those are the people that God loves to use. It really is. Now, 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 the greatest testimony is a testimony like my lovely wife, Bonnie, as opposed to mine. But the greatest testimony is to live your life and serve God all the days of your life and not lose your mind. That's a great testimony. You agree? Does everybody agree with that? Yes or no, right? But I will say this, that in the scriptures, God seems to highlight the knuckleheads. Those who have done the dumbest things possible. Those who have the, hor the horrible, the most horrible of all past. Those are the ones that God seems to highlight. And the reason why I believe is not because our testimony is better. It's because God can show himself off stronger. Because we look at those folks and we go, oh my goodness, if God could use him, then there's still hope for me, I think. Right? All through the scriptures we see that. Jonah, for example, ran from God and God used him. Noah got drunk. And God used him to save the world, all of mankind. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. God used him. Jacob was a liar, and God used him. Gideon was afraid, and God used him. Moses was a murderer and had a bad temper, and God still used him. Rahab was a prostitute, and God used her. Samson liked prostitutes, and God still used him. David was an adulterer. Elijah was suicidal. John the Baptist ate bugs, and God used him. 
Jeremiah, Jeremiah, that's a powerful book. you got to read the book of Jeremiah. He's called the weeping prophet because this guy was always weeping and puddling up and crying. He was always so emotional. This was the kind of guy that took bubble baths listening to Michael Buble while he's on Pinterest. But God was still able to use him. <laughs> Amazing thing. Peter denied that he even knew Christ, and God used him. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Thomas was too negative. Man, if you want to know, I'm here's something amazing. Lazarus, talk about God being able to use anybody. Lazarus was dead for three days in the tomb, and God still used him. Man, that's an awesome thing for us. When we feel like it's over, and it's done, and it's dead, God can still resurrect that in our lives and use us. That's good news, isn't it? That comforting. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much. I know there's probably a lot of us here this morning that have we've heard that those voices go off in our heads. We've thought about and been reminded of our past. We've been reminded of the disappointments, the tragedies, the hurts, the pains, the wounds. And we've somehow allowed the devil to convince us that because of that stuff, we're disqualified. That our life really doesn't have purpose. At least not the kind of purpose that would ever inspire us. That would move us. That would carry us through life. And yet, what we see in your word is you're a God that doesn't want to leave things broken, crippled, pained, wounded. Your desire is for us to engage, to step out, to ask, and to experience your wholeness. What a beautiful picture that is. Here we are with a past that's full of brokenness and pain, and yet... Your voice speaks through us, and it gives hope to so many others. It inspires men and women to love you and to serve you. You took our tragedies. You turned them into a testimony of life and hope. You took our mess, as it says, and turned it into a message of redemption and restoration. You're the only one that could ever pull that off. We are so thankful. We love you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, everybody.